Bienvenidos a un nuevo episodio de la serie Diálogos con Jorge Gestoso rumbo a Claxo 2018, el primer foro mundial del pensamiento crítico que se realizará en Buenos Aires, Argentina, en el mes de noviembre. Una serie en la cual estamos entrevistando a personalidades a nivel mundial. Hoy tenemos el honor que nos acompañe aquí en Washington Sandra Polaski, ex subdirectora de políticas de la Organización Internacional del Trabajo, la OIT, y actualmente una experta independiente en políticas laborales y sociales. Sandra Polaski, a uh, warm welcome to the program. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. Sandra, of all the issues going on in this uh, world, convoluted world, which one is the one that you are following more uh, with more attention? That's quite a challenging question, all right? <laughs> It's a big world with lots of things going on. Let me, let me say the following. Um, as a policymaker and as an economist, if I begin to answer your question, I'll think of myself as being in the space station. Now I'm orbiting around the Earth and I'm looking down at this world of ours, this Earth of ours. And from that perspective, seeing the patterns around the world and from the perspective of history and what's happened <clears throat> over the last hundreds of years, I see a very positive picture. I see a situation where in the last 20, 30 years, hundreds of millions of people have been lifted out of poverty in many countries, in China and elsewhere. Uh, many people have much better health now than their ancestors ever had. People have longer life expectancies. It's not even, but overall, life expectancy has gone up. Fewer babies die. So I see, I see a world where much progress has been made in reducing poverty and improving the quality of, of life for human beings. As I'm going around mm -hmm. in the International Space Station and looking down and not seeing all of the details and the blemishes. But now we begin to re-enter in the orbit and we're going slower and we're looking at individual countries and you see a very uneven picture. So you see some countries that are growing very strongly, um, a number of developing countries. Uh, t during the uh, uh, first decade of the 2000s, most of Latin America was growing very strongly, not as much now. China and Southeast Asia continue to grow very, very strongly. Um, but you begin to see this slowdown in a number of the high-income countries. Um, and so you see a very uneven pattern. Now we're coming closer to make our landing and we're going more slowly and we're over some parts of the world where things really are quite, quite horrible. I mean, we're over Yemen and we see people starving in the midst of a, of a war. We're over Central America, we see endemic levels of violence that disrupt people's daily lives. We see parts of the United States that used to be prosperous manufacturing areas that are now depressed. You have male life expectancy going down, you have a drug crisis, you have deaths from overdose. So when you ask me, what do I see in the world that's most fascinating? I see all of these things. I see these very positive patterns, but then I see very, very uneven developments um, uh, recently. And I see places where we have uh, problems that are getting worse, not better, that we have to address. And yet I would say that I see in general a positive development of, of, of our people, of the human race, and of, of uh, the global economy. And what would you say that in the way that um, globalization and trade has affected employment, standard of living, and inequality? Well, that's, that's very interesting because when I describe this picture, I'm partly thinking as an economist as well as a policymaker, and I would say that much of the progress in terms of lifting people out of poverty, um, one can trace to globalization. It is the fact that a number of economies, in particular China, but not only China, Southeast Asia, Indonesia, um, parts of Africa, have become more integrated in the global economy. They had the opportunity to export and to create jobs. So that has been part of the reason that we see this positive picture of people coming out of poverty, joining the working class, joining even the middle class, better standards of living. And yet, globalization and trade always create winners and losers. Uh, people specialize as a result of trade, and the people who used to make something in one country now, they're outcompeted by another country. And this, again, is a very big explanation for why we have this, this uh, depression in parts of the United States that used to be prosperous manufacturing areas. The same is true in Europe. You can go to parts of France that are doing very well. Some parts are, are, are very uh, depressed. Uh, Southern Italy probably never got very developed. And 
In Latin America, we had boom times for about 10 years, the uh, commodity super cycle, but not only. We had some very good government decisions going on in, in Brazil and Argentina, um, and now some of those things are, are being reversed. So I think that globalization um, is, one, is one big explanatory factor about these positive developments, but also some of the negative developments. And do you believe that the national governments have the chance to have an impact in the welfare of their own people? I absolutely believe that. These forces that I've been talking about, globalization, these are strong forces. They push in a direction, but they are not destiny. They don't, they don't determine. And, and the way that we can tell that national governments still have some space um, to make policy, which is in the interest of the, the well-being, the welfare of their own people, is, is for example, let's look at some, some contrasts of things that some governments have done. In this context of globalization and trade, and just looking now at the last 30, 40 years, a period that you and I are old enough to be familiar with and to remember, let me contrast uh, two strategies choices, if we can call it that, of two different governments, Mexico and China. So when NAFTA was negotiated, uh, Mexican manufacturing wages were two, three, four times as high as Chinese manufacturing wages, depending on the part of the country and the industry. Over the years, the Mexican government, governments, several governments in a row, decided on a policy of repressing wages, keeping wages low, um, keeping union bargaining power weak and controlled by the government. So wages stagnated in Mexico. In China, in about 2003, uh, the government that came in then, the Hu Jintao government, decided that China needed to increase wages for the well-being of their own citizens, but in large part because they did not want to always depend on being an export economy. They wanted to create enough income um, to be able to have domestic demand. Well, from 2003 until now, 15 years of double-digit minimum wage increases and more than double-digit increases in other wages what you have now is a situation where Chinese average manufacturing wages are higher than Mexican. Most people really find that hard to believe, and yet it's a fact. And the Chinese government now can depend on domestic demand coming from these, these workers' wages, which they now spend in the economy, so that in the recent few years, the largest part of Chinese growth, of GDP growth, has come from consumer demand of Chinese consumers, not of export demand. Are they becoming a bit more independent in their policy space? Yes, I mean, they have, they've exercised that kind of policy and it's given them more space. Now let's contrast with Mexico. Mexico has repressed wages, kept them very low. Basically, the manufacturing wage in Mexico in dollar terms is about $2 an hour, stagnating. In the U.S., with wages in manufacturing also stagnated, they're about $20 an hour. So you have a 10 to 1 ratio. That's the same ratio as when NAFTA was negotiated and came into effect in 1994. That was a policy choice. It has left Mexico vulnerable to the charges of Donald Trump and the Trump administration that Mexican wages are undermining U.S. wages. Well, there is some element of truth to that because of the repression. So the, this is just one example, but I think it's a very dramatic example that governments can make decisions about what kind of policy they want to have, what is their vision of how will they develop. Are they going to develop with sweatshops, with low wages, or are they going to develop by raising wages and, and pushing those employers to increase productivity so they can afford those wages and gradually move up the value added chain and have higher standards of living, better products, or are they going to compete on low wages? And what is your, your view on the role of the free trade agreements? That, that's very interesting because the free trade agreements can have some influence on these choices. Um, Mexico under NAFTA could have raised wages. There was nothing in NAFTA which says Mexico could not raise wages, and yet the government made the decision to compete on low wages. But there were many things in NAFTA which actually pushed in the same direction to keep Mexican incomes low. For example, the agricultural terms of NAFTA, as you may remember, basically opened the Mexican market to U.S. agricultural exports. So instead of having small farms with peasant farmers growing maize and corn, you had U.S. automated advanced technology exports of corn. 
flooding the Mexican market and displacing farmers. Well, those displaced farmers now have to look for some other source of income. That was also a pressure keeping wages low. Um, so the trade agreement reinforced policy choices being made by the government and in some ways perhaps constrained because of, of the negative impact on, on agriculture. So um, trade agreements have a lot to do with, with how globalization actually affects individual countries. And the larger case that I would, I would point out about trade agreements is that the United States, for example, in its trade agreements while they have inserted labor clauses or social clauses into trade agreements which require respect for some basic labor rights and so on, those clauses have tended to be very weak and not very enforceable. However, there have been protections for investors, protections for intellectual property, protections for, in other words, for capital, uh, which have been very strong and very enforceable, protections for labor which have been weak and not enforceable. So. At the same time that the pressures of the global economy were, were, were pushing against workers' bargaining power, now you have this huge Chinese population and other parts of the world coming into the global labor force. So that was tending to push power away from workers and toward owners and, and investors. And then you have governments, including the US government and its trade policy, writing the terms of trade agreements that protected those who were already benefiting, the investors and the, and the owners of, of factories and firms, and not protecting the workers. And the result that we have, of course, we can, we can see now in the US. We have some very unhappy manufacturing workers who and were farmers. not protected, <laughs> and farmers. And, and, we have, and we have a government which is uh, claiming to address those problems, but I would argue not addressing them in. Precisely, talking ways. about uh, President Trump, what do you think about his policies of uh, trade and in a way protectionism and tariffs? You know, it's a very interesting question because there are not very many policies of the current US administration that I agree with and that, uh, that I think are wise for the country. However, what I just described about the trade policies of the US where there was a lot of protection for investors and for intellectual property but not much protection for, for labor and for workers, that was a policy that crossed administrations. So it was a policy during the Bush one and during Clinton and during Bush two and, and during Obama. That was the continuing policy. The interesting thing that, that Trump has done is that you could say he has taken a hammer and he has broken up the consensus that that's a good thing to do. I haven't seen that he has a good policy to replace it, but he has broken that consensus on trade. And that leaves us in a very interesting place. There could be space for new trade policies, which actually are much better for working people and much better for, for the population of the trading partners with less emphasis on the rights of capital to move across borders and to be protected in investment. And what about other forms of governance? For example, the G20, what do you think about it? Uh, that's, that's an interesting question as well. I think that the, the arrival of, of the G20 to replace the G7, in effect, I think is basically a positive development. So the, the G7 created in the 1970s, those were the seven biggest economies in the world then. They are no longer the seven biggest economies. A few of them are among the top 10. Some of them are not even in the top 20. So the G20, which now involves as well, of course, China, India, Brazil, Argentina, um, et cetera, Indonesia, Turkey, in a way, if you're going to have a, a sort of a committee of governments to coordinate the international economy, the G20 is a much more appropriate committee composition than the G7, because it includes countries at different levels of development, representing far more people, a much larger share of the global economy, and so I think that the, uh, the G20 in that sense is a good development. It can be more representative. That said, I think the G20 really has been a huge disappointment because, because? They, they came through the global financial crisis. Well, that was really when the G20 was designated as the premier uh, coordinating body for international capitalism. Um, they came through the crisis itself, the depth of the crisis, pretty well. They did coordinate, um, for example, the US and China in particular, but a number of other governments as well, had very strong fiscal stimulus. 
to compensate for the fact that the private sector was collapsing and the private demand of both by the households and, and firms was collapsing. The government stepped in and began massively spending, building infrastructure and so on. And it probably was the reason why we only had a severe recession and not a depression in 2008 and 2009. So G20 did fairly well at that level of coordination. But since then, with all of these problems of uneven development, the, the issues that we've already been talking about, the G20 has not really stepped up to the challenge. They, they have become a bit of a talking shop um, where they, they pledge greater cooperation. Um, I was a Sherpa at the G20, and I can tell you that it became more and more fashionable to begin every, every uh, summit uh, communique or declaration saying we pledge to create more and better jobs for our people. But what they actually did to create more and better jobs for their people was, was virtually nothing. There was no real coordination that would have, would have produced those results. And what else the G20 could have done or do it? Well, if we take the example, uh, I just mentioned that the, it became fashionable for the leaders to begin their communiques by saying, we will create more and better jobs for our people. What, what could they actually have done as G20? Well, for example, suppose that the G20, these 20 largest economies in the world, accounting for 80% of the global economy, suppose they had decided we are all going to have a coordinated increase in our minimum wage. Whatever level we are at now, we are all going to have a one-step 10% increase in our minimum wage. What would happen? Well, first of all, you would be putting a lot of money in the pockets of ordinary citizens. Minimum wage affects the low income and people just above the low income more money into the pockets of people who really need it. They would go out and spend it. It would stimulate the economy. And some people would say, well, if we raise our wages and our competitor doesn't, we'll lose our competitive advantage. But if US, Mexico, and Canada, and Turkey, and everyone else was raising 10%, no one loses competitive advantage. And yet, you have, you have put money into the pockets of the workers, and you've slightly started to rebalance this notion that globalization has benefited the investors and the owners of capital and not labor. That was a very practical thing that the G20 could have agreed to do, but they didn't go near that. We've seen all over the world, we've seen a refugee crisis, if you want, and also a masses of um, immigration, mm -hmm. legally and illegally. What is the impact of those two phenomena on the labor market? If you look at migration over time, the patterns of migration and the effect on economies and on labor markets, over time, migration is always a net plus for the con receiving country that gets the migrants. Why is that? An economy is built of, of three factors of production, land, labor, and capital. Well, land and natural resources, whatever, whatever you have, whatever your endowment is, so your, your farmland and your oil uh, minerals, capital, what you have to invest to create factories, to buy machinery, produce it, and labor, to work and, and to produce the goods and to move the goods, provide the services. If you have an influx of, of migrants, this is more labor and it's an asset for your economy. So over time, um, it's always the case that you can say um, migrant labor will be a net plus for that economy over time. The problem is how fast can the economy absorb the influx of that migrant labor? And that depends on what is the state of the economy? Is it in, in the contracting phase of the business cycle or the expanding phase? Um, do you also have an increase in land? For example, the years when my ancestors migrated to the United States from Poland, mm -hmm. well, you had land being acquired across the United States. So now you had more land and more labor to work it. It was a plus. But if you have a very, very rapid influx of labor, the economy may not be able to grow fast enough to smoothly absorb it. Eventually it will, but in the short run, you can have some negative impacts. Generally speaking, it will be positive for most of the migrants themselves. They probably have come from countries where they can improve their standard of living, even for the first generation. But there may be some pressure on the, the uh, low-skilled labor that competes with the migrants in the short term. So it's a question of pace. It's a question of a flow. And, and governments typically try to have some control over the pace of migration. Um, so when there are booming economies, it's a time to let in more migrants. When the economy slows, you let in fewer. But the migrants themselves also have that sense 
fewer people come when there are fewer jobs. More people come when there are more jobs. So over time, migration is always a plus for the receiving economy. But in the short term, it can come too fast sometimes, and that can create both economic adjustment challenges, but it can also create political challenges. And I for think example. what what we're seeing right now in the United States and in many countries in Europe is that the challenge of, of a big influx, and in many cases, these are not only economic migrants, but in addition to that, many of them are refugees, refugees from wars, from, for example, from Syria, or from very destabilized places. Parts of the Sahel, for example, have terrorist insurgencies going on. And, and we have people coming from Central America because of the prob both economic but also problems of violence. So when you have these surges, which are, which are driven not only by economic need or the desire for economic improvement, but escaping from something that's really bad, it can come very fast and it can be faster than the society can readily and smoothly absorb. That doesn't mean that it can't be absorbed, but it may be a period of, of some years or even some decades before there is, there is a real integration of, of those migrant workers. And the situation we are in now is we've had some of these, what I would call pulses of, of intense in, in migration of refugees and economic migrants. And it's been difficult to absorb them. Germany is having a very difficult time. It's a very wealthy country and they welcomed 800,000 refugees, but they're having a very difficult time finding adequate housing, adequate jobs, adequate schools, adequate health care for them. And some politicians turn it into obviously a, a, a weapon, something that they can attack the existing government with or other parties. And, and a lot of havoc is being created by this, by this very negative formulation, um, which talks about these difficulties of, of big influxes of migrants um, and turned into a, quite a negative. You were working at uh, Geneva in Switzerland for many years with the International uh, labor uh, organization, what you call it in Spanish, OIT. OIT. And uh, there are some concerns, that at least for some of the countries that they believe that they are small fishes in a big pond, that the, the level is not, is the, 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 the terrain is not level in the, in the OIT, because the big fishes eats alive the small ones. What, what do you think about it? I think actually, Jorge, that, that the OIT, the ILO, um, is an organization which by its structure um, gives a lot of rights to the small fishes. So that when, when we, I, I now have retired and I'm an independent expert, but, but was recently one of the top leaders of, of the ILO, when we would have our annual conference, every country had a right to have uh, X number of delegates, two delegates. Mm -hmm and their labor movement had a right to have one representative and their employers groups had a right to have one representative. My numbers might be slightly off, but it was basically that proportion, 50% governments, 25% workers organization, 25% employers, and every country had the same representation. And when it came time to vote, every country had one vote. So in a sense, it's a great leveler in, in the way that the UN system can be, not the Security Council, but the General Assembly. Um, that said, the, um, the dues paying members are based on the size of GDP. And so the larger the economy, um, the more that they pay. And I, would, I wouldn't be completely honest if I didn't say that some governments would, would try to exercise some influence based on the fact that they were contributing 20% or 15%, 10% of the dues. Um, I think that the ILO has been quite good at saying that it represents all 185 member countries equally. And I think it's, it's been able to resist the big fish eating little fish there. How do you see Latin America? Uh, Latin America is probably one of the parts of the world when I'm in my orbit up in the International Space Station um, that causes me a lot of concern. Because? Because it's, First of all, it's one of the most unequal regions in the world, um, the biggest disparities between the wealthy and the poor. Um, and against that backdrop, in the first decade of the 21st century, you had some very good governments um, in, in your country, and Uruguay certainly continues to be, um, for a while in Brazil, for a while in Argentina. 
and, and you saw a lot of progress. You saw inequality coming down for the first time in decades in many Latin American countries. You saw people being lifted out of poverty, comparable to what I was describing in Asia. You had, you had large numbers of people being lifted out of poverty in, in Brazil and, and some of these other countries. Um, you had improvements in the standard of living, quality of life for, for the average citizens. Some of those gains are now really under attack, I think, in Latin America. And, and so it's one of the areas that concerns me because it was such a source of hope and also some very good examples to the world. At the ILO, we were pointing to things that Brazil was doing to incorporate workers from the informal sector into formal jobs, to get them benefits in the formal sector, to get them registered. We were pointing to Brazil um, as, as a, a place where you can take lessons, where you, they, they've done very creative things. And now some of those same programs are being rolled back by the current government. So, so it's a source of concern for me. Mexico, well, I've been giving you the example of Mexico versus China. What did they do for their workers? And I said Mexico took a path which was a low-wage sweatshop path. They have a new government now, and the new government is talking about doing things quite differently. So it may be that, that we're beginning to see a move back in the direction of good government, which really cares about the well-being of its average citizens and pays particular attention to the poor and the vulnerable. So Latin America is a mixed bag. So, um, Sandra, um, the, what would you be your advice to the people who are watching us and, uh, and they are thinking to register and participate in that CLACSO event in, in Buenos Aires in November? My advice would be this is going to be extremely exciting. I understand that the first day or two is going to be in a soccer stadium full of people listening to former presidents listening to very distinguished senior leaders from Latin America but from around the world, uh, top thinkers. I think it's going to be extremely exciting. I think the first days in the soccer stadium we will be levitating. There will be so much energy, so much good energy, thinking forward, thinking what can be done, and then getting into panels and workshops and interactive sessions where people can talk about what can we do in our country, what can we do in our community, what can we do in our sector. So I think it will be the place to be in November. Sandra Polaski, thanks very much for joining us. It's been a pleasure to be here.